Congressman Magaziner, welcome back to the show. Always a pleasure to have you here. Yeah, great to be back. Thanks for having me, Bill. What's 2024 look like for you? For me, 2024 looks like continuing the work of trying to deliver some results for for working people in Rhode Island um, uh, from Congress. Um, Obviously, uh, with the uh, House Republicans having just constant chaos and constant infighting, it's it's a difficult environment to get things done, but I am hopeful that there are things we can do. Um, So I'm going to continue to be working to fight against some of the cuts that House Republicans are trying to make to important programs in education and health care and Social Security. Um, and I'm also going to be fighting for an agenda to try to expand um, uh, policies that will help working people. For example, there is actually a chance that even in this divided, chaotic Congress that we may be able to get an expansion of the child tax credit through, which uh, would do a lot to lift people out of poverty. So we're going to be focusing on that. Um, going to be focusing on uh, uh, getting ready to introduce a bill uh, to help expand uh, paid leave uh, for workers uh, across the country, which which uh, would be great for working people and for families. Um, so, you know, we're going to be continuing to push, you know, an, an agenda that's positive at the same time that we're, you know, trying to prevent painful cuts and um, uh, and then trying to bring as many resources back to Rhode Island as we can. As, as we're filming this today, you know, we just had another round of bad flooding in Rhode Island yesterday. So, you know, we're working with the rest of um, uh, our partners in the Rhode Island delegation to make sure that Rhode Island is able to get some federal relief to help with that. And so we're going to continue that work as well. What's interesting about this this flooding phenomenon is that uh, it's there's always been issues of flooding. And you can think back to 2010, of course, the Warwick Mall famously flooded out, and that was a severe event in and of itself. Right now, we've had what seems like back-to-back-to-back incidents of flooding around the Patuxent River, around the Wood River. All throughout the state, the Blackstone, of course, looking at Newport and the Point. What, what's your gut on this? Obviously, climate change is at play, but just from an infrastructure standpoint, in the hyper current moment, what yeah. can be done from your from your perspective to mitigate some of these persistent flooding incidents? Well, as a representative for for Rhode Island in Congress, I can say to my colleagues from direct experience in Rhode Island. Climate change is real. We are living it. The Narragansett Bay has risen six inches in the last 30 years. Uh, we, as you know, we're having more frequent flooding and worse flooding. And I can also say that we know from Rhode Island that there are real solutions. And you know, we're proud of the fact that Rhode Island is a leader on offshore wind, and we're on a path to have almost 100% of our electricity uh, be renewable within the next decade. Um, so I think we have an important story to tell here in Washington from our own experience in Rhode Island that, number one, we have a real problem here. I mean, people being displaced from their homes, entire neighborhoods being wiped off the map. But we also know that there are real solutions. Um, and as far as resiliency goes and improving our infrastructure, uh, this is why it was so important that we passed the bipartisan infrastructure bill and why the federal government is really finally starting to get serious about giving states and cities the resources to upgrade our infrastructure because it's expensive work. Um, And of course, it's going to take a number of years to do the work, but we have to protect that funding and we have to continue to keep the pressure on the administration, the Biden administration now and whatever administrations come in the future to get that money out the door and get it to states. Because even if we do all the right things and we transition quickly to clean energy, we're still going to have to focus on resiliency and and uh, the realities of extreme weather and rising sea levels. Another piece of this is the jobs surrounding clean energy. After this interview, I'm going over to the Met School where there's going to be a, a green jobs career, career fair. Yeah. I think that's really interesting. You've introduced some legislation around this. In fact, I would say it's you know one of your first major pieces of legislation. Talk about the need for a workforce that can meet the moment right now. And yeah, absolutely. Um, you're absolutely right. We have a real opportunity to create good jobs while we transition to affordable clean energy, but we got to train the workforce uh, in order to do it. Um, you know, for example, uh, one of the fastest growing job categories in the entire country is wind turbine technician, uh, both offshore like we have in Rhode Island and also onshore as well. And these are good jobs. I mean, wind turbine technicians can make $80,000 a year plus overtime without a college degree, no college debt, um, but it does require some training. And that training can start in the high school level 
uh, or even the middle school level uh, with good CTE programs. Uh, so yeah, one of the first bills that I'm, I'm introducing in Congress is called the Clean Energy Workforce Act. Uh, it would create a series of grant programs to fund career and technical education programs that have a focus on clean energy and training young people for clean energy jobs. Uh, I'm excited about it. It's a bipartisan bill. We, we have a re Republican co-lead on the bill. We have a couple dozen co-sponsors, and, um, and I'm, I'm excited to have it be one of my first pieces of legislation that I've introduced. You've been drawn into switching gears here. You've been drawn into, you know, what seems to be a recurring pattern of uh, Republican usage of a variety of tactics to just almost so chaos. Uh, in this case, the impeachment hearing for Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, uh, the initial hearing held yesterday. You were there. Your take on what's going on with that situation. Well, we need, a, we need a system at the southern border that is safe and orderly and fair, and we have real challenges there, no doubt. Um, but what's happening is that in this era of Donald Trump, House Republicans have not shown an interest in governing or legislating or actually trying to solve problems. Instead, they just resort to what Donald Trump does, which is personal attacks against individuals. Uh, you know, they censure people, they try to impeach people, they try to shame people at, at public hearings instead of actually doing the work of, of trying to solve the problem. And so, um, you know, there are things that we can do and we should do that will help the situation at the southern border, right? Like, I am one that believes that we do need more resources for border security. We also need comprehensive immigration reform and more well-defined pathways uh, for people to come to the country legally because we, we need people. Um, and there's such a contrast here. I mean, on the Senate side right now, as we speak, the secretary is working with Senate Democrats and Senate Republicans to try to craft a plan for the border. House Republicans are not engaging in those talks at all and instead are just focused on impeachment because for them, just the politics of personal attacks are really all that they know how to do. And not just that, I mean, they've d done everything they can to try to undermine the secretary in doing his job. So there's a request right now that the administration has made for $14 billion for the southern border, for personnel, for technology, for asylum judges, for things that would help create a more orderly system. House Republicans have refused to call a vote. And some of them have even said publicly, well, we're not going to do that because we don't want to give Biden and the Democrats a win. They're, they're being very transparent about the fact that they're not even trying to solve the problem. They're just trying to play politics. And, and of course, there's a real tragic side to this, which is that there are many people whose lives are being negatively impacted by the political games that, that the Republicans are playing. Um, you know, people living in border communities, certainly the migrants themselves, uh, personnel, uh, 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 public safety personnel at the border who, who could really use some help and could really use some reinforcements, they're all being hung out to dry um, because House Republicans aren't engaging in earnest to try to solve the problem and instead are, are focused on impeachment, which, by the way, there's no legal basis for. I mean, even, even if you don't think that the secretary is doing a good job, that's not a basis to impeach someone. The Constitution doesn't say that you can do that. There has to be a high crime or a misdemeanor. And I sat through this four hour impeachment hearing and I really tried to listen to my Republican colleagues to like hear from them, like what's the legal argument for impeachment? And they don't, they don't have one, um, you know, because for them it's about politics. So, you know, uh, for us, like we're gonna continue doing the work and trying to solve problems, um, but it is hard in an environment where the majority party in the house seems to care more about politics than about solving problems and working together. And it's good that you noted as well that the border situation is is problematic as currently constituted. For some reason, I find some folks that are just unwilling to concede that point. No. It doesn't really help anybody's cause. And there needs to be a path towards ultimately citizenship that is much more well-defined. It's a very expensive process. It's an exhausting process. And a lot of times, it's it's as you described, it's unclear to folks how to get from point A to point B in a, in a reasonable manner that can be managed. We're not there right now, and we do need yeah. that change. 
That doesn't mean you impeach the Homeland Security Secretary or attempt to impeach the Secretary. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and look, I, I mean, as a member of the Homeland Security Committee, I went to the southern border last year. I've, I've been studying up on the issue. Um, it's obviously not one that, you know, we faced directly in Rhode Island until recently. But, you know, it's it's my job, so I'm learning it. And, um, and there absolutely are things that we can do um, that would help create a more orderly system down there. I mean, the bottom line is that there are people who are leaving unstable countries. Venezuela is a dangerous and unstable place right now. So is Cuba. So is Colombia. And um, it, by the way, most of the migrants who are coming are not coming from Mexico because Mexico is relatively stable in most places compared to some of these other countries. And, and they're coming, escaping violence, escaping poverty. And many of them have a legal right to come under asylum law, but the system gets backlogged and people are having to wait months and months to get their cases heard and they get desperate they get hungry they get tired and and they will sometimes you know then try to cross illegally or pay or have somebody say hey i'll, I'll if you pay me money i'll get you across or whatever because they're desperate so what do we do well there's a lot of things we can do first of all we can make it easier for people to apply for asylum or apply for green cards from their home countries so they don't actually have to show up at the border in order to have their claims processed. That would help create a more orderly system. Um, I do believe after having gone there that more personnel uh, is part of the answer too. not just border patrol, but also um, uh, uh, personnel working at the legal ports of entry to process people in an orderly and swift fashion. Because again, it can take years now for people to have their their applications process. So there are things that we can do that are common sense things, um, but it takes resources and it also takes collaboration between Congress and, and the executive branch, which right now, uh, unfortunately, is very challenging you know, given the political dynamics. 2024 election year. Uh, look, it looks like it's going to be a, a Trump-Biden rematch, and it is what it is. For some folks, that's dreadful. For some folks, there may be some excitement. Will you be out there in any way, shape, or form campaigning on behalf of the president? Or uh, what, what's your involvement going to be in, in this election cycle? Absolutely. I'll do whatever I can to get Joe Biden reelected. And, and I hope everyone who's listening will do the same because the stakes are incredibly high. Um, democracy is on the ballot again, unfortunately. Trump is openly saying that he will be a dictator. He is openly plotting to use you know, the, the judiciary and uh, uh, the tools of the presidency to punish his political opponents. We already know that he used his first term in office to enrich himself and his family. I mean, he literally ran a hotel that the Saudis and the Chinese and others were staying at, knowing that that money was going directly into his pocket. Um, we can't have that again. And on the other hand, President Biden has accomplished a great deal that, that we have to campaign on. I mean, the Inflation Reduction Act for the first time in history, Medicare is negotiating with the drug companies to lower drug costs. We've capped insulin at $35 a month. The bipartisan infrastructure bill is making huge investments, fixing infrastructure across the state, expanding broadband access, replacing lead pipes. Um, the PACT Act to help veterans uh, who are exposed to toxic substances. I mean, the president has, has accomplished a remarkable amount in a short amount of time. And most importantly, he believes in American democracy and he believes uh, that we need to have a system where whoever loses an election doesn't try to deny what happened. Uh, in contrast to, to Donald Trump, who has no regard uh, for our democracy or our constitution. So I absolutely am going to be doing whatever I can to help Joe Biden get reelected. And I hope everyone else does as well. Yeah, and that message right there, you hope that you would hope that that would resonate more so than an attack level message where we've seen the president this week, even in South Carolina, calling former President Trump a loser and things of this sort. You can understand the dynamics around that and why that you know is helpful yeah. to rile some people up. But ultimately, he's got to run on his record because that is, yeah, it's 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 there for everyone to see. It's a it's a good record to run on, and and I also think I'm firmly of the belief that you don't beat Donald Trump by acting like him, which I think is the point you're making. And Biden won last time by appealing to the fundamental decency of America and Americans. Um, and uh, if he does that again, while Trump is talking about being a dictator and, and attacking his opponents, then I think I think we'll be all right. Congressman Magaziner, 
Thanks so much for your time. Happy New Year. I, I, I guess it's too late to say that. Larry David has a rule. You're not supposed to say it after the January 3rd or something like that. But nonetheless, Happy New Year. Well, happy New Year to, uh, to you too, Bill. And thank you. Uh, uh, good to see you.